Hello, my name is Alexey Konosevich, and you are watching Blockchain State YouTube channel. Let's talk about cryptography. I bet many people think that cryptography is very complicated and only techie people can understand and need it. Definitely, sophisticated mathematics underpins modern cryptography. I was a lawyer and I didn't know much about it either. When I decided to become a software engineer, uh, focusing on blockchain. Uh, cryptography became one of those things that I had to study. And I made a few important conclusions myself. First, people need to know cryptography to some extent. There are three levels of it. The first is mathematics. The second is software engineering level. And the third, user level. And this is the level that you need to know if you want to understand blockchain technology. I don't think that those who call themselves experts in blockchain technology are competent enough if they do not understand at least the user level of cryptography. Secondly, because I made this journey myself, I know how to explain it to non-techy people in simple terms. You don't need to understand the complicated mathematics. It's like a remote control from your TV. Who even knows how it works? But you know how to use it what button to click to get an expected result. That's what you need. So join this exciting journey into the world of ciphers. At the top of this diagram, you see mathematics. Mathematics is the queen of the sciences. Here are modular operations, elliptic curves, and a bunch of other stuff. But like I said, you don't need to know all this. You just need to know that it's solid. There is a level of uh, cryptographic primitives. This is the level of actual cryptography where all the mathematics is put together and starts working. Here you find cryptographic hash functions, digital signatures related to asymmetric key cryptography and other primitives of uh, symmetric key cryptography and so on. Cryptographic primitives are a low level class of cryptographic tools. Primitives do not mean limited. It means basic, fundamental, something that gives rise to everything down below on our diagram, protocols and applications. The protocols is the level where primitives are wrapped up with useful functions and specific uh, usage scenarios. And finally, we see the application level where primitives and protocols are used in programs providing user experience. It is the level of blockchain and cryptocurrency and indeed any other user applications. Let's begin with most of the basic primitives, cryptographic hash function. Not every hash is cryptographic, but in everyday use under hash, we usually understand cryptographic hash. The hash function allows you to get a uh, digital fingerprint of data, figuratively speaking. The hash uniquely identifies the data from which it has been generated. To hash data means to get a short string of a hash sum. Sometimes it's also called digest or checksum. You can get a hash from any digital data, a file, a text, a video, a document, folder, or even the whole disk drive. Hash sum has three basic features. First, it's deterministic, which means you always get the same hash from the same piece of data when you apply the same hash function to it. Irreversible means one-way function, which means it's impossible to retrieve the original data from the hash sum. When you see the hash sum, there is no way to practically understand what is hidden behind it. Like I said, it's a highly complex mathematics that underpins it. Practically, no collisions are possible. The theory says that they are possible, but mm, there are myriads of combinations. And so uh, their occurrence is neglected in strong cryptographic functions. So hash is unique, which means two different inputs of data will give distinctly different hashes. It all means we have a good tool to verify data authenticity. For example, 
you have a file, say a contract, and you calculate it, its hash sum. Suddenly you lost the file, but the hash sum left. So you ask your counterparty in this agreement to send a copy of this file. How do you know that this is exactly that contract that, that you signed with your partner? You calculate the hash sum of the file that your partner just has sent you and compare it with the hash that, that you have previously kept. If they are identical, these hashes, when you compare them, then this is the same file that you signed before. If at least one bit of data changes, you will have an absolutely different hash sum. There is a simple online tool where you can play around with different standard cryptographic hash functions. As you see here, there are different hash functions protocols. They have different names and the most popular are RIPEMD and SHA-256. They are used in Bitcoin. 256 means the length of the hash sum in bits. Regardless of the amount of data you're trying to hash, with this hash function you always get the digest of the same length of 256 bits. The technology of blockchain relies on a hash function. The chain of blocks means the connection of blocks with hash sums. Each next block of the blockchain contains the hash sum of the previous block. That's why when someone tries to replace the original block somewhere in the chain, it will break the subsequent chain of blocks in the blockchain. Because as we remember, a change of at least one bit of the original data results in a distinctly different hash sum. It means the next block hash will also become different from the original version of the previous block. The same happens for all blocks until the last one in the chain. There are generally two divisions of cryptography, symmetric and asymmetric. And it's very easy to understand. Symmetric involves only one secret key that is used for both, to cipher and to decipher information. There are different well-developed protocols and standards like advanced encryption standard or data encryption standard. Asymmetric cryptography is also known as public key cryptography as it operates with two keys. One is secret, another one is public. They are both mathematically connected and separately used to encrypt and decrypt data. Here is a short list of the most prominent asymmetric protocols and standards. Duffy Hellman Key, Exchange Protocol, RSA, uh, Digital Signature DSS, uh, PGP, uh, ECDSA, and a number of others which I didn't mention. There are a lot of protocols and standards. When you hear someone say mm, modern cryptography, they are referring to asymmetric cryptography. Why? Well, uh, while Symmetric cryptography has been known for millennia. You probably heard about the Caesar's cipher. The asymmetric one was invented in the 70s of the 20th century and it became a turning point in the development of all digital technologies. Everything in ICT fundamentally relies on asymmetric cryptography. It is relatively new and it is still actively developing. Some of those who invented it are still alive. I had a chance to chat with Professor Ron Rivas from MIT when I was writing some academic papers. Ron Rivas is one of those uh, founding fathers of asymmetric cryptography. He was the co-author of the legendary RSA algorithm for digital signatures. R stands for Rivas, for his surname. Now let us finally unpack how it works. So the user firstly generates a so-called pair of keys. You need to feed random bits into the algorithm to ensure you don't generate the pair that someone in the world already has generated. Lack of randomness can be exploited for breaking the cryptography. So then having two keys in the 
simplest application asymmetric cryptography works as follows. You use your private key to encrypt data and get a secret message. And you or someone uses the relevant public key to decrypt this message. You can share your public key with the one who supposedly should read your message, but you keep your private key secretly. So the private key ensures that only you can create an encrypted message, whilst the, the public key can decrypt it. This is the practical difference between the symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. So when you need to share you, your secret key in symmetric cryptography, it's only one secret key that is uh, used to encrypt it, decrypt it. And so the one who gets it, they can also encrypt the uh, secret message, so to say, on your behalf. But with the asymmetric cryptography, it's impossible because you get your private key and it is separated from the public key. However, it also works in a reverse way. Anyone can use your public key to encrypt message that can be decrypted only with your private key. So the one who has your public key can secretly communicate with you. And as long as you keep your private key safe, only you can read the message to you. Cool, isn't it? But this technology is more than the, just a way of secret communication. So you might have noticed when I explained the first hymn, I emphasized that the fact that the one who holds the public key by being able to decrypt the message besides revealing the secret message gets another knowledge. They know who is the author of it because only one specific private key can encrypt it and so decrypt uh, with the public key. Here comes another useful application of asymmetric cryptography. It is used as digital signatures. The scheme works as follows. In this case, you don't want to send a secret message. Let's have an example with conventional cryptographic characters. Alice and Bob. First, Alice shares her public key with Bob. It is called a handshake. Now Alice can sign her message. For this, Alice calculates a hash sum of her message and encrypts it with her private key. So she doesn't encrypt the message itself. The encrypted hash sum of the message is considered to be her digital signature. Both the message and its signature she sends to Bob. Signature verification occurs as follows. Bob receives Alice's email and decrypts the signature with Alice's public key. As a result, he gets a hash sum that Alice encrypted. Then Bob calculates the hash of the message that he received from Alice and compares these two hashes. If they are identical, he knows that it was Alice who signed it. The cornerstone idea of this scheme is that only Alice's public key can decrypt the signature. If Bob cannot decrypt it, it means it's not Alice's signature. Or he decrypts it, but the hashes do not match, which means Alice signed another message. She could accidentally send a wrong file or someone tampered with this message along the way, but it's not the same. We can conclude that the private key is used to generate a unique identifier of data, which is called a digital signature, while the relevant public key decrypts it and plays the role of the digital identity of the person who owns the private key. Digital signatures are the next crucial element of blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is kind of database that keeps records of ownership. The cryptocurrency is attached to users' public keys. The typical output of a transaction recorded in a block shows how many coins were attached to a specific address in the result of this transaction. For example, Alice had three coins on her public key A1 and four coins on her public key A2. When she paid the sum of both coins to Bob, 
he received seven coins on his public key B. Now, if Bob wants to send the coins to Dave, he must digitally sign the spending transaction with the relevant private key. So to say, to prove his ownership of these coins, similar to what Alice did when she paid to him. So Bob sends his spending transaction to the network, which contains the record of how much he wants to send and to what address and his digital signature to authorize this transaction. Users can generate as many keys as they want to. The blockchain contains only records of the addresses, which are representations of users' public key. Therefore, it is considered to be anonymous or pseudonymous. Now let's get back to a broader application of uh, digital signatures. Practically, we don't use such a scheme to sign documents because we don't know if the person lost his private key or even if it was stolen. To address this problem, people invented a public key infrastructure. It is a protocol that involves trusted third parties such as certificate authorities or trust service providers, which is the same but, but usually called so in the EU. Uh, such a party maintains the current status of the digital identity. If there was no trusted third party and Alice's private key was stolen, Bob, when receiving a message, wouldn't know um, that it was not Alice who sent it. So in the PKI scheme, if Alice loses her private key, uh, she will call to her provider, to certificate authority, Dave, to ask to mark her public key invalid. Even if someone uses it after that, Bob, each time reading uh, a new message from Alice, first will ask Dave, well, it happens automatically through the electronic communication, in, this, in the system between two servers, and Dave is, in this scheme, is their trusted third party, who will respond if it was invalid when the message was signed. PKI is also useful for remote interaction of people who have not even met each other. In this case, Dave is that trusted third party who verified Alice's identity and Bob's identity. So if Alice and Bob don't know each other, but they know and trust Dave, their certificate authority, they can still interact with each other remotely, uh, knowing that Alice is Alice and Bob is Bob. The pan-European uh, network of licensed trust service providers of digital signatures is known under the name of EIDS. Another example of large-scale use of digital signatures with public key infrastructure is uh, trusted websites, so-called HTTPS protocol. If you click on the lock icon in the address bar of your browser, you will see a certificate provided by some trusted certificate authority, which means that the website you deal with is actually the website you expect to deal with. It hasn't been hacked or faked. If you want to know more about the topic of digital signatures and the use of blockchain, in that case, you may want to watch this video, how European experience can improve e-signatures and digital identities in Australia, and not only. You also may want to watch this tutorial with digital signatures in Bitcoin wallet. All the links uh, that I mentioned in this video, you will find in the description below. So that's it for today. Now you know what digital signature means. Uh, some people confuse it with the broader term of electronic signatures, which covers all possible forms and technologies of signatures, not only cryptographic. Another time we will talk about how to protect your cryptocurrency wallet, as its safety heavily relies on cryptography. See you!